Yes, we go ahead and start the clock. All right, so what we're going to look at here are a number of different things. I was going to include a portion of the lesson that I just decided to hold off on, which was like inauguration of Jefferson Davis, inauguration of Lincoln. I'm actually going to save that for lesson six. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, Davis is going to be inaugurated in February, Lincoln inaugurated in March, and then the, you know, We've already talked about the start of the war at Fort Sumter in April and Lincoln's call for federal troops. Um, so we're going to um, get into the early clashes of the war. Here we have a lithograph of the Battle of Bull Run. You can see the chaos on the field. Some of those folks, you see this guy down front dressed in that Zouave um, drill uniform that the 11th New York would have worn, um, and a number of others. You, you see gun smoke, cannon, chaos with horses and multiple flags being waved. Another thing to point out too that is not all that accurate in this lithograph is that um, most Confederates wouldn't have been wearing gray in this battle, they would be wearing blue. Um, it's too early on for them to have gray uniforms, or they would have been wearing what I referred to earlier as the butternut uniform, which is just like the homespun um, uh, uniform that they would have worn in their militia, or a uniform that, or something they would have maybe been hunted in. Um, or in some cases, the military uniform they might have worn at a college like West Point, VMI. Um, Citadel. All right, so first clash is after Sumter. Um, before North Carolina and Virginia seceded, state, state troops started moving in and seizing federal property within their state boundaries. I think I mentioned this in lesson five. Most of those forts fell pretty easily with the exception of the, of the port forts like Sumter and Pickens and, and um, some of those off the coast of South Carolina and Florida. Um, and remember, Confederate soldiers are going to take these. State militia forces are going to take these. As soon as Lincoln was elected, in the election was in November, and by the time the election was made official and South Carolina seceded, state militias start forming. Do keep in mind that a lot of these Southern officers and um, enlisted men in the Army, they were stationed near where they lived. So a lot of the Southern guys had Southern duty stations. Um, John Buchanan, uh, Buchanan Floyd, are you all familiar with John B. Floyd? He was, uh, he was a Virginia State Governor, um, served as Secretary of War, under President James Buchanan. He actually is, he's lucky he didn't get impeached for, for um, uh, embezzlement. He had some really shady deals as Secretary of War under Buchanan, but before he could be uh, removed from office or even censured, he resigned and decided to not only secede, but he moved hundreds of cannon from an arsenal in Pittsburgh to the Deep South. Um, mostly in Mississippi. So that's kind of like the underhanded dealings that were going on, and that's just one example. Um, Virginia officially secedes on April, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They secede in, on April 17th, but do keep in mind that Virginia's earliest meetings for secession date back to February, and then the official vote is May 23rd, I believe. You can double check that for me if you like. May 23rd, I believe, 1861, but the date that we recognize for the convention uh, of secession is going to be April 17th. Um, remember that Robert E. Lee was originally asked to command Union forces. Uh, he was like Winfield Scott's right-hand man um, during the Mexican War, and he's going to say to Winfield Scott, well, actually not Winfield Scott, he's going to tell the um, uh, Bell um, 
you know, I will not turn, and he, he writes a letter to Winfield Scott as well, I will not turn my sword against my native state, um, you know, I will go with Virginia. So when they have this convention, Lee is sort of given command of Virginia forces, but it's not what you think it is. Like, Lee doesn't have as large a command as you think. Lee has got a, a pretty modest command early in the war. And Lee's first engagements are not where you think they might be. They're actually in western Virginia, not in, in and around Richmond and the Peninsula campaign. That comes later. So the Lee that you're thinking of, I would imagine, would be the Army of, of Northern Virginia Lee. We're not there yet. We're not, that's not going to happen until um, the Battle of Seven Pines at, in the Peninsula Campaign. All right, so uh, after between, from the time that Virginia has their secession convention, between the 18th and the 20th of April, Harper's Ferry falls to the Confederates. Um, Norfolk's uh, Naval Yard will fall to the Confederates. And Union troops under Benjamin Butler, a.k.a. the Beast, he hasn't gotten that nickname yet, but I'm going to refer to Butler by his nickname throughout the semester. Um, he got that nickname from the people of New Orleans. He is going to mobilize Fort Monroe. Do you remember we talked about that? In, wait a minute. I said lesson five. I mean, we talked about that in lesson four. So a little bit of this is like the first bullet there, and then that fifth, that's a little bit of a review from where we talked about in lesson four. A little bit about Elmer Ellsworth. I told you I provided you an article there um, on the uh, paired with the lesson. Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, uh, close friend of Abraham Lincoln's, first Union officer killed while trying to remove a Confederate flag from a um, the Marshall House Inn's roof in Alexandria. The, the proprietor of the inn, James W. Jackson, had, uh, he was a secessionist. He had flown the flag. Ellsworth, um, who was a member of the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry, that was the the uh, Zouave uh, drill unit. He marches in there, pulls down the flag with a double barrel shotgun. Jackson shoots Ellsworth in retaliation. Uh, Ellsworth's friend and compatriot um, Francis E. Brownwell will shoot and kill uh, James W. Jackson. And interestingly enough, by the end of the war, um, J uh, Francis E. Brown Brownwell will be awarded uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor. We'll, we'll come back to Francis E. Brownwell um, down the road. We'll talk more about the 11th New York as well and their service in the war. Um, they're, we're not done with them. So, um, I like, got a, uh, four images that I wanted to show you here. Um, on the top left, it shows you the ballot box for um, the secession vote because the secession vote for Virginia was very lopsided. And so on the left, it's got, you know, secession or stay in the Union and stay in the Union with the bayonet. Um, this is the Virginia state flag as we know it is adopted um, by um, the Virginia Confederate state, the six Semper Tyrannus flag, um, thus always the tyrants. Uh, down here is the Norfolk Naval Yard and then to the left here, the death of Ellsworth. So here we have Ellsworth and then there's Jackson. You can see he's got, he's brought the Confederate flag down. Okay, questions there? Let's talk a little bit about Maryland and Delaware. Maryland, yeah, uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, Maryland was quite divided during the war. In fact, one place in particular that was very divided was the city of Baltimore. Any ideas why Baltimore would be a divided city? What do we know about Baltimore economically? What do you think about when you think about Baltimore? Anybody gone to Baltimore before? 
yeah, there's industry and there's a harbor, right? So you've got a lot of merchant trade coming in and out of the Chesapeake, right? So you can imagine that both secessionists and unionists passionately want um, Maryland to go one way or the other to either stay in the Union or go with the Confederacy. Turns out Maryland was under control of a Unionist governor, Thomas Hicks, and Hicks was not interested in seceding, and Lincoln is going to take advantage of that, and he will suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Essentially what that means is he declares martial law, and soldiers are going to be sent into Maryland, and many of them are actually going to be marching through Maryland and through the city of Baltimore on their way to, to Washington, D.C. to mobilize for the war. This leads to secessionists in Baltimore, and many of which were actually affiliated with nativist gangs and other organizations, um, saying, wait a minute, this is against our state's rights. These soldiers are marching on our state. Therefore, we're going to rise up. So on April 19th, so we're just talking about just a short time after Sumter, um, just a little over a week later, the Baltimore riots occur. Has anybody ever heard of the Baltimore riots? This is actually the first bloodshed of the Civil War. More, more casualties in the Baltimore riots than in, at Fort Sumter. Um, so this is uh, basically pro-Confederate secessionist mobs, some of which are affiliated with some, some nativist gangs and other um, organizations. Some of them are like flat out fire eaters that want Maryland to secede, are going to attack Massachusetts troops marching through and bound for DC. Four soldiers and 12 rioters are going to be killed in the mob violence. So the state, again, is divided during the war, but what we're going to learn is that even though Maryland stays in the Union, it's not going to work out the, the way the Confederates had anticipated. On two occasions, actually more than two occasions, but two major occasions, Virginians expect Marylanders to or not just Virginians, but Confederates expect Marylanders to come to the aid of the Confederacy and secede, and it doesn't work out. And there's one major event in particular, and that's in the fall of 1862, and that's when soldiers are marching toward Sharpsburg, Maryland, the Battle of Antietam. A lot of, a lot of folks, including Robert E. Lee, thought Marylanders were going to take up arms, and a lot of them did fight on the side of the Confederacy, but it wasn't a um, it, it wasn't the reception that Confederates had anticipated when they marched into Maryland. And there's not a lot of engagements that occur in Maryland. There are a great deal of skirmishes that will be fought, like smaller battles, but there's only one real major battle that will occur in Maryland in the American Civil War, and that's going to be the Battle of Antietam, which we'll get into in depth a bit later. Um, so just a bit of a breakdown, 35,000 uh, white men, 9,000 African Americans are going to fight for the Union. Um, about 20,000 will fight for the Confederacy, those, would be, those being white. I want you to keep in mind there's only an estimated 5,000 total African Americans that fall on the side of the Confederacy. And we don't know if those African Americans that mustered were did so voluntarily, or they did so, uh, you know, were forced to do so. These are very difficult records to obtain. In fact, this is like hotly debated that there was just a um, a uh, piece on this very topic um, on on a podcast that I listened to um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, it's uh, can't remember the guy's name that did it, but basically what he was doing was he was interviewing, it's not, um, it's not David Horowitz, it's a different guy. Basically this guy went out and was doing interviews. Um, he does interviews at Battle Reactors. 
And so he's interviewing, I'll find out the guy's name. I, the reason I'm thinking of Horowitz is because Horowitz wrote Confederates in the Attic, which is an incredible book that I would encourage you guys when we do the book review, that would be like a really cool one to check out. But um, yeah, so this guy kind of went around and there were, there in this podcast, he's interviewing two guys and it just turns out the one guy is a uh, sort of like a Confederate reenactor, but also an expert on, you know, Confederate artillery. But the guy he's arguing with doesn't realize that guy is a professor of Civil War at Gettysburg College. So they're like butting heads um, respectfully in this podcast. Um, I'll pull it for you, though, when I, when I can find it. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, moving on to Delaware. So keep in mind, Delaware is like the, the one border state that there's not, there's, I wouldn't say there's not drama. There's obviously secessionists in Delaware that want to go with the Confederacy. But they've got a northern Democratic uh, um, governor, and that is William Burton. And Burton is, Burton and the uh, Delaware um, state legislature are going to quickly vote to stay in the Union in January of 1861. So they're one of the, they're actually the first border state to vote, um, vote to stay in. Nearly all, I do want to point this out. This is an interesting fact about Delaware. This is sort of like a, a little bit of a compromise between uh, Burton and Lincoln, obviously. Burton's not a Republican. Um, he's he's wholeheartedly not a um, abolitionist. I mean, do keep in mind, you know, Northern Democrats were not, you know, if a Northern Democrat felt passionately about uh, the abolitionist cause, they may as well have gone with the Free Soil Party or the Republican Party. Um, so no, he is not a abolitionist by any means. So what he said was this. Um, after Sumter, after the events of Sumter and the call for federal troops, um, he said, I'm not going to give you any federal troops. But what I will do is I will encourage my men to enlist. So that was kind of like a compromise between Burton and Lincoln where it's like, okay, we're not going to press the issue. If you stay in the Union, you know, we're sort of catching more flies with honey, so to speak in that situation rather than pressing the issue and potentially why would it be problematic to lose Delaware? Why might that be a problem? I mean Delaware is a tiny state, but why might you not want to lose it? It was the first thing. <laughs> Symbolic. Um, I'm looking geography. Yes, you're you're both you're all you're right. Okay, it, you've got that gives the Confederates more access and potentially could do you know build more defenses um, along the Chesapeake Bay. And what is Delaware in close proximity to as well? Maryland and D.C. Right. So that gives the Confederates another point to potentially surround D.C. So. About a thousand men from Delaware did fight on the side of the Confederate Army. This is uh, another lithograph. I'll share a lot of lithographs with you guys. Um, this is a lithograph of the Baltimore riots on April 19th. And it says Massachusetts militia passing through Baltimore. So they are fighting off some of the mob violence here. So who's involved in the mob violence? Like I said, it's a, it's a who's who of um, ruffians, some fire eaters, some, some native, nativists. Has anybody ever heard of the Pug Uglies before? The Pug Uglies were a nativist uh, gang in uh, Baltimore. Um, well, they didn't mess around, that's for sure. We're all from, you know, you talked about, well, we'll talk more about the Gangs in New York later too, uh, dead rabbits and the, and the 
Order of the Star Spangled Banner in that group. Um, all right, Porter State. Kentucky was a little bit more uh, complex um, than Maryland and Delaware. Obviously, um, Lincoln and the Union and Lincoln's cabinet and re Republicans, whether we call, we can call them, at this time they're not being called radical Republicans, they're actually being called black Republicans. And I don't want you to confuse that with they are not African American. That that is that we don't have African Americans running for office yet. Um, that was just the term used for what will become more in the radical Republicans. Um, so, a little bit about uh, clearly clearly they want to keep Maryland and Delaware for you know geographic economic you know population purposes. They don't want to lose those states. Obviously, Lincoln wants to keep the union together, as he'll talk about in his first inaugural address. And we're going to, you know, pull some excerpts from his inaugural address in Lesson Six. So let's talk a little bit about Kentucky and the importance of Kentucky. It is symbolic in it is the birth state of both presidents here, the birth state of both Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln will go on to be elected. Um, you know, from the state of Illinois, Davis elected from the state of Mississippi. Uh, you know, their roots are in Kentucky. Um, they also have roots in Virginia, which we'll talk a bit about later. This is a brother's war, okay? This is a state where a great deal of families were divided and fought against one another. And I, you can find that in all of the Upper South and, you know, some of the old north, Northwestern states, but especially these border states, okay? So some examples of significant, prominent families that were divided, who had people fight on both sides of the war, Henry Clay and Mary Todd Lincoln's families, both had family members fighting on the Union side and the Confederate side. Early in 1861, Kentucky planned to stay neutral, and Davis and Lincoln both wanted to um, honor that decision. Kentucky is an important state for a lot of reasons, but there is one significant reason why neither side wants to lose Kentucky, and that is access of the Ohio River Valley. Okay. The Ohio River Valley is a profitable artery for the country, and the Union doesn't want to lose that. Not to mention, what major manufacturing city could the Confederates potentially launch an attack across the Ohio on if they did, in fact, successfully take the state? Chicago? No, I'm not looking for Chicago. I'm looking for another city that starts with a C. You don't think about this city nowadays as a major manufacturing hub, but at that period of time it was very good. I don't know who said it. Whoever said Cincinnati, well done. It was a de it was a desperate fear that Cincinnati would be lost. Who said that? Nice man. Good job. All right. Hey, there's the there's the bell. Um, so just after Tennessee seceded, many young men from Kentucky went into Tennessee um, to join the Confederacy. So I'm going to I'm going to wrap up with Kentucky, and next time we'll move on with Missouri. Missouri is very complicated. West Virginia is very complicated. So that that's what we'll, we'll focus on um, on Monday. Uh, so uh, I love this guy's name. Kentucky Governor Beriah Magoffin um, secretly allowed Confederates to come into the state to recruit, but also allowed for Unionists to run for and win seats uh, in a Kentucky border state election. So he was playing both sides. Lincoln is going to send Major Robert Anderson, same guy from Fort Sumter that lost Fort Sumter, to Kentucky to recruit Union volunteers. Um, the event that kept Kentucky and the Union was actually a really minor invasion um, on the part of the Confederacy. 
Confederate General Leonidas Polk, a.k.a. the Fighting Bishop. Um, he was an Episcopalian bishop um, in Richmond. Crossed into Kentucky on his way to advance on General Ulysses S. Grant. Grant is not like on the level just yet you, you think he is. He's, he's just received his command in Cairo, Illinois. Kentucky saw this as an invasion and an act of aggression. So the legislature will allow for Grant to drive Polk out of the state and Kentucky will officially stay in the Union um, and claim its loyalty to stay in the Union on November, in November of 1861. Here's a bit of a breakdown. About 50,000 white soldiers will fight on the side of the Union from Kentucky. About 24,000 um, African American Kentuckians will fight on the side of the Union. And about 35,000 whites uh, will join the Confederacy from Kentucky. And then I've got a couple of early pictures of, we got a Union, Kentucky Union soldier on the left and a Confederate soldier from Kentucky there on the right. And that is a great place for us to pump the brakes.